Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Be Curious Lates. This event is all about terahertz technology. My name is Andrew Lee, and I'll be your host for tonight. So this evening is part of the Be Curious Festival, which is the University of Leeds annual research open event, where we're here to invite you to take a peek at what goes on inside the university. We'll be going live with a Be Curious activities and events that explore everything from the world leading to the wondrous right up until the 15th of July. So be sure to check out the rest of the program after this evening's event. We have hands-on activities for families after school each day at 4 p.m. and plenty more lates for adults to enjoy at 8 p.m. each night. So back to tonight. You've heard about microwaves, x-rays and infrared, but what about terahertz? Well, tonight we will explore the exciting possibilities of terahertz radiation and find out how it can allow us to see more of our galaxy and improve our understanding of the Earth's climate and also how it can help us better understand materials, save energy, and create new materials and electronics for the future. With me tonight, I have a fantastic lineup of three researchers from the Hyper Terahertz Consortium, which is a partnership between the University of Leeds, University of Cambridge, and the University College London. Each speaker has 10 minutes to tell you about an area of their research, and after that, we'll be inviting questions from you. If you have a question for a speaker, please just post it in the chat which you should be able to see on your right hand side when viewing this event in YouTube. If not, then we'd recommend clicking the option to view the event in YouTube to get the best experience. Our moderator team will be keeping an eye on the chat and would love to say hello to some of you this evening. So let's give it a try now. Give us a big hello and let us know when you're tuning in from today uh, using the chat. So tonight's speakers are Lucy Hale from uh, University College London, Nikita Armand from the University of Cambridge, and in a slight change to the billing, we have uh, Alec, Alex Valavanas from the U University of Leeds, who is standing in for Eleanor Nuttall, who couldn't be with us this evening. So first up, I'd like to welcome Lucy to introduce us to the wonders of terahertz radiation. Lucy, okay. over to you. Thank you. So thanks, Andy, for the introduction. And thanks to all of the Be Curious organisers who've done a great job putting all of this on. So today, me, Alex and Nikita are going to be talking about research we do, studying the world around us using terahertz radiation. And as Andy mentioned, I'm actually a bit of an, an imposter at this science festival because I'm not based at Leeds at all. I work at University College London, but all this work you'll hear, as Andy said, is part of a big collaborative project between Leeds, Cambridge, University College London and Lancaster called the Hyper Terahertz Project. So I know Hyper Terahertz and maybe even Terahertz sounds a bit weird and sci-fi now, uh, but hopefully by the end of the night, you'll have a bit of an idea about what Terahertz is, the potential of Terahertz technologies and the challenges that we face when we're working with Terahertz radiation. So as I said, Hyperterahertz is a team of physicists and engineers across these universities who all develop tools to generate, detect and control terahertz radiation. And this is our YouTube page if you'd like to go and have a look later. Um, but the first obvious question to address then is what is terahertz radiation and why do we want to use it? Well, terahertz radiation is a type of electromagnetic wave. and um, this is just like visible light or x-rays or, um, for example, gamma rays. And if you think back to your school days, you may remember seeing pictures like this of the electromagnetic spectrum. And all types of radiation or light sit somewhere on this spectrum. And the only real difference between the different parts of the spectrum is how long the wave is, uh, or to put another way, what the frequency of the wave is. So on the very long wavelengths, side we have radio waves that are very low frequency and then on the very high frequency side or short wavelengths we have x-rays and gamma rays and you probably actually recognize all the names of all the different types of radiation shown here um, and that's because over time scientists and engineers have developed efficient ways to emit detect and control all these different types of radiation but what we don't see in many diagrams of the electromagnetic spectrum is that there's one region of the spectrum where historically we haven't done such a good job harnessing and using the radiation and that's the terahertz region of the spectrum. 
So it's called that, the terahertz region, because it has frequencies around 10 to the 12 hertz. So meaning it has a wavelength of uh, about 300 micrometers. So this is a terahertz. And it sits between microwave and infrared radiation on the spectrum. And sometimes researchers call this area the terahertz gap. And the reason for this is because whilst we can really efficiently generate microwaves on one side and infrared waves on the other side of this, um, the, we have a hard time um, in the middle. And this, this graph from a paper shows this uh, conundrum kind of really obviously. So for, this shows the power of different sources of radiation with frequency. So at the very low frequency side, we have quite high power. And then on the high frequency side, we also have high power, but the power of these sources drastically drops off in the middle around a terahertz. And so this is the terahertz gap, and that's a big challenge for us researchers. So before we go into why we have that terahertz gap, firstly, we want to talk about what, why we might want to use terahertz radiation in the first place. Because it's a valid question, if we already have all these other types of radiation, why try to look elsewhere on the spectrum? And as it happens, there are uh, the way terahertz radiation interacts with different materials could make it beneficial for loads of applications. So firstly, terahertz waves can travel through opaque and non-metallic materials, and this makes it potentially useful for security screening. And if you went to the Hyperterahertz live demonstration last week, you'll have seen a real kind of life example of this. Secondly, in the arts world, terahertz radiation has been used to see under layers of paint to reveal interesting hidden features and even authenticate paintings, like in this example, um, or to identify the age of and the origin of ancient pottery. And then in addition to traveling through opaque materials, lots of chemicals and molecules have unique spectral responses to terahertz radiation, which you can think of as like that chemical having an individual fingerprint when you shine terahertz radiation on it. So this can help us identify chemical compounds. And here's some examples of the spectral fingerprints of different illegal drugs, for example. Terahertz always also very efficiently absorbs water. So this makes it possible for use in medical imaging and medical diagnostics. And actually, unlike x-rays, which we commonly use for these things, it's non-ionizing, so it's much safer for patients. So on top of these, there are many more interesting applications. And tonight, you'll be hearing from Alex and Nikita, who will talk about two particularly exciting areas of terahertz research in the hyperterahertz program. So definitely stay tuned for that. So that's why we want to use terahertz radiation. But why is it more difficult to use terahertz radiation than other areas of the spectrum? Why does that terahertz gap I mentioned exist? Well, actually, this comes down to the fundamental physics of how we generate radiation in the first place. So at different parts of the spectrum, different generation methods can be used. And at lower frequencies, like when we generate radio waves or microwaves, we mainly use electronic methods. So basically, we design and build a circuit made of, up of electronic components, where electrons in the circuit wobble back and forth. And it's this kind of jiggling of electrons that generates an AC current and therefore waves. And then the faster this happens, the higher the frequency of the emitted wave. But if we want to go to higher and higher frequencies, you know, right from radio wave all the way through to terahertz, we run into problems because the electrons have limited speeds they can travel in the materials. So if we try to make them oscillate faster and faster, they basically can't move far enough in a, such a short amount of time to generate the current needed to get electromagnetic waves. And it just so happens that this limit is sort of towards the top of the microwave nearing the terahertz range. So that's a problem at low frequencies. But what about on the other side of the spectrum at high frequencies? And you might be thinking, well, I know that we have good sources of visible light, like lasers, for example. So why don't we just borrow those same methods to generate terahertz waves? And that's a good idea. So the way that terra, I mean, that visible sources um, like lasers generate light is based more on what we call optics rather than electronics. 
And this is when light is generated by stimulating the movement of electrons in between energy levels in a material. So you have these different energies that electrons can sit at. And then when electrons drop down in energy levels, they lose energy and they emit a photon of light shown by this squiggle here. And actually the wavelength of light that is emitted is determined by how big that jump the electrons made between the energy bands. So to generate terahertz radiation compared to say visible light, we would need to find an, a material with a much smaller energy gap. And firstly, it's really difficult to find materials like this. And then to make the problem worse, at terahertz wavelengths, the energy gap is comparable to the size of um, energy that the electrons have anyway at room temperature due to heat. So electrons are sort of bouncing back and forth with the, between these gaps anyway, and it's quite hard to control and amplify this process. So you can see that we're kind of, in terahertz, um, we're a little stuck between the middle of these two areas. And what I've described here sums up a key challenge when we're trying to generate or detect or control terahertz waves. And it's probably one of the biggest reasons that you'd never really heard of terahertz radiation or seen terahertz technologies in everyday life. But in our hyperterahertz project and in wider terahertz research, we try to get around these obstacles by still using some of the same concepts from other areas of the spectrum, but combining these with specially designed materials or cleverly engineered devices that are made in really high-tech labs or clean rooms with complex instruments like you see here. And the hope is that by overcoming these challenges in a lab environment, this can then open up new applications in the real world and in real practical settings. So, Next, we're going to hear from Alex and Nikita about some of the particularly in interesting and exciting research directions that are part of the project. So for now, uh, science, terahertz and science and technology is mostly in the realm of scientific research, but maybe soon you'll start hearing about it or seeing it more in the wider world. Um, so thank you for listening. And that's all I have. And I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has in the chat. Wow, thank you, Lucy. That's really fascinating. So we have a couple Thanks. of questions that have popped up in the chat. Um, I'm going to jump straight in. And I, I, there's a question here from Stephen Andrew. Um, is terahertz considered safer to use, for example, than x-rays to humans and other things like historic works of art? So yeah. I guess why is, the, why is the difference? Uh, what, what is it that makes terahertz safer to use on these uh, precious uh, items? Yeah, so um, precious items also being ourselves. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically it is safer to use on people, for example, than X-rays, and that's because it's non-ionizing. And, and what that means is it has less energy than, for example, at X-rays. So uh, the electromagnetic waves don't have enough energy to knock electrons off the atoms, basically, and uh, that can cause things like skip, like skin damage and like damage to your cells. So that's why it's um, it's safer to use for for in medical things because it's non-ionizing. And then I'm not sure about historic works of art actually, I w like whether it's the same issue potentially, potentially it is. But also with works of art, maybe they use certain chemicals in paint, for example, that terahertz responds really well to, and we get good imaging. So that's why it might be useful in that field. So I think that was a follow-on question I was going to ask was, is it the difference in the uh, historic inks that maybe mm. have been painted that you'd be able to detect using the uh, the radiation? But Yeah, so for example, like different parts of the spectrum, um, different chemicals might uh, yeah respond really well to it. So I think usually in these kind of art settings, they'll do a number of things. So they might look with x-rays and an infrared scan, and terahertz could add to that to potentially look at different chemical compounds that don't show up quite as well with the others. Uh, is it able, in, in the same way, is it able to look at subsurface imaging, so kind of looking at topographical features, perhaps? Um, subsurface. So in, it depends what the surface is, I guess. So, for example, in, in medical imaging, um, because it does absorb water so strongly, there's only a certain depth you can go to until terahertz is completely absorbed. So, so that's one challenge. So if you have something that's very has high water content, you can't see much past the surface. But 
um, but yeah, in terms of topographical Im imaging, you can definitely combine terahertz with other methods like atomic force microscopy to look at to topographic features. Wow, amazing. Okay, we have a, a, another couple of questions here from AC. Um, what is the uh, what was the R in RTD in, in, in one of the slides that you showed? R uh, in RTD. What does, Let it, me look. what does it stand for? Let me, I'm not sure what. Oh, so there, that's a certain terahertz source, and it's called a resonant tunneling diode. Um, so those acronyms are just fancy names for different types of terahertz sources, and all of these are basically trying to overcome this problem that I'm talking about, and they use uh, different but specific techniques to do so. Um, but yeah, that's a red, resonant tunneling diode. Excellent, excellent. I think uh, uh, our AC is, is, is rather keen on terahertz. We've got another question from AC. Can, can a, a micro cavity magnetron be used to generate this radiation? I think that's a bit out of my area, to be honest. I'm not quite sure. Um, maybe we'll have to look it up, but yeah. I'm not Sounds sure. exciting though. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> Okay, well, I think we're uh, out of questions now, but I think it, I think it's time to uh, to move on to our next speaker. So I think it's time to thank Lucy for her, her wonderful talk, and we'll uh, move on. So next up, Alex will uh, we have Alex, and he'll explore how terahertz can help us understand more about space and about Earth's own atmosphere. Great, thanks very much, Andy, and thanks to um, Lucy for the uh, the really nice introduction to terahertz. So, I'd like to start by thanking um, my colleague Eleanor Nuttall, who prepared a lot of the slides. She was originally going to present these, but unfortunately, she's not around to do that. Um, I'd like to start by just sharing an interesting fact that when we look into space using any of our existing uh, visible light telescopes or infrared or radio wave systems, we see less than half of the light in our galaxy. And so that missing bit of the light that we can't yet really look at all happens to lie within the terahertz band of the spectrum. And really a lot of that reason is that um, deep space is quite cold. And so the, the radiation that's still being emitted has its peak at these very low photon energies in the terahertz band. So there's a huge incentive for space researchers to really start developing instruments that can detect and analyze waves in this part of the spectrum. So there's more to it though. Rather than just being able to see stuff we can actually make use of the fact that, as Lucy said, a lot of gases have very distinctive um, fingerprints in the terahertz part of the spectrum. So that's a little bit like if you've ever seen chlorine gas and you see this sort of greeny yellow color to it. Well, lots of different gases have a very unique color. And that comes from the way that the light interacts with the molecules. Now, it happens, though, that a lot of the gases that you're interested in studying in space have their so-called colour in the terahertz part of the spectrum that we can't really see. So as an example, if we look at the life cycle of a star, what ends up happening is we get these clouds of um, gases and particles that end up kind of clumping together and forming uh, um, a, a, a a star where it starts these fusion reactions. The star lives out its life and eventually the star will die um, through uh, various different processes and release a lot of that gas out again. And you get these kind of molecular clouds appearing. And over time, they evolve and they clump together and float around and new stars will be born out of it. Now, at each stage of that life cycle, we get different gases that are really useful as tracers of what's happening. So if we can look specifically at those gases, we can really understand in great detail how the star formation happens. And this will really fill in a missing piece of the puzzle that astronomers have been wanting to uh, understand for, for many, many years. If we look closer to home, then we can look in the um, 
uh, in the Earth's own atmosphere. So the bit that we live in is kind of right down here, uh, the lower levels of the atmosphere. The gases that make up um, everything around us, uh, things like nitrogen and oxygen, that are really quite sort of dense, stable gases. But as we go higher up, the pressure of the gas becomes much lower. And what that means is that the molecules are very, very far apart. Now, at the same time, we have from up above, uh, ultraviolet radiation coming in, cosmic rays, meteorites, all sorts of things coming in from outside of the Earth. And those interact with the gases up there. And so they kind of break apart into these very high energy particles. Um, we call them radicals. And they're very reactive. But because they're so low density, they tend to sort of hang around there for quite a long time. Um, so there's this very reactive layer of the Earth's atmosphere that a lot of interesting stuff happens in. And in some ways, it's a gateway between the Earth and the near space environment. Now, when we think about climate change, what we're really observing most of the time is just the stuff happening right down here. And it happens over the scale of years or decades. But there's evidence to suggest that there are reactions that happen extremely quickly in response to uh, the changing climate in the upper part of the atmosphere. And being able to detect the gases up there and map them out over the world and see how the concentrations are changing over the course of the day would really allow us to understand a lot of the processes behind climate change very clearly. And that's something that's missing from a lot of the climate models that, um, that researchers have at the moment. And again, terahertz is the key to being able to sniff out these gases and really understand how they're changing. So there are really two main ways in which you can um, uh, analyze the gas. And so one of them is what we could call active sensing. So we're going to get a terahertz radiation source, so a thing that's chucking out terahertz radiation. We then take a sample of the gas that we want to study, and we look at which colors of light are absorbed in the, uh, in the gas using a detector on the other side. And by doing that, we can work out the fingerprint of this gas that's, that we've taken a sample of. So that's really good for doing lab-based studies. But if we want to study something in space, we can't nip out into the nearest star-forming nebula, take a sample of the gas, and then bring it back to the lab. We need to look at it remotely. And so for that, we use a technique called radiometry. And by doing that, what we're, what we're looking at is um, gases where the molecules are in a high-energy state. So they could have been heated up or knocked about a bit or um, something has raised them up to a higher energy state. And as they drop down in energy, they emit a burst of terahertz radiation with a very specific frequency. And by using our detector system, we can basically look at this gas uh, in space or in the upper atmosphere and figure out what it's made of. So one of the real challenges is how we make systems that we can actually put onto a real satellite. Um, it's really not a trivial thing, because unlike systems that we build in a lab, which might look something like this, this is about the size of a standard dinner table, by the way. Um, if you look at it, it's made of the lots of individual mirrors and lenses and things, moving parts, all of these uh, bouncing terahertz waves around. And the whole thing is driven by a very high powered and very expensive um, femtosecond terahertz laser. Now, if you want it to go on a satellite, it needs to be very small, very light. It needs to be very power efficient because you need to run it just off the satellite's solar panels. And it needs to be very robust, which means that it's got to be able to survive being stuck on the end of a rocket and fired into space. And this sort of conventional approach just won't do. So the kind of approach that we're developing at Leeds and as part of the Hyper Terahertz consor Consortium is um, these very compact sort of sugar cube sized systems um, that are based on something called quantum cascade laser. And so these, just for context, these little screw holes that you see here, they're actually the same pitch that they are on this bench. So, you know, it's a really very much smaller system. Now, if we look inside the little block that I showed on the right hand side, then you've got the laser itself, which is only about a millimeter long. And if we zoom in on that by about 100,000 times um, on the facet of it, 
we see this kind of layered um, sort of lasagna-like structure where we've got two different materials stacked on top of each other in many, many layers. Now, each of those layers is really grown to atomic precision, which means that there's not a single atom out of place when you're doing this uh, sort of structure. And there's only a handful of places in the world, Leeds is one of them, that can grow these really very precise structures. Um, because the layers are so thin, quantum mechanics starts to take over. And that means that any electrons that go inside this structure have to live inside uh, very specific energy levels, in, like I've shown in this diagram. So if we start putting an electric, uh, electric current through the device, electrons go in through one side, and they then step down through the uh, energy levels, um, a bit like a ball falling down some stairs. And we call that a cascade uh, or a quantum cascade. And so a terahertz photon is emitted at each step. And this means that you get really quite a lot of terahertz power for not a lot of electrical power. Um, and so researchers at the University of Leeds were um, among the first in the world to, um, to make these devices work. And we hold the world record for the highest terahertz power uh, generated from these sorts of devices. So there's another side to this, though. We've shown how we can make very compact sources of terahertz radiation, but actually getting the radiation to go where we want inside our system and to actually use it in a useful way is really quite complicated because we need optics to kind of make the light go where we want. Now, if we look at the um, at the low uh, the, the low frequency end of the spectrum, um, as Lucy did, we can generally call these kind of electronics or radio wave type techniques. And so we have systems like um, reflectors, radio antennas, and so on. And these need to be made really very, very precisely because the wavelengths at terahertz are so small compared with radio waves. It means that the structures need to be tiny and they need to have um, very good surface qualities um, to, to work. So it's very difficult, actually, to get them working at terahertz. Um, the high frequency end of the spectrum, though, this is what we normally think of as optics. So we have things like lenses and fibers and so on. But the materials, again, just don't really work at terahertz frequencies. Or There's a very um, limited number of materials. And so commercially, there aren't very many um, terahertz optical components available. So one of the things we've done recently as part of the UK Space Agency Pathfinder program is to look at um, alternative techniques for producing terahertz optics. So one of them is uh, based on 3D printing. And so what we're using here is uh, a range of different 3D printing techniques to produce structures that could be used for terahertz lenses or filters to block out certain colors of light. Um, the first one here is called fused filament fabrication, which is a little bit like a Mr. Whippy ice cream machine where you're squeezing a, um, a sort of semi-solid um, material out and then fusing these filaments together. Um, you can see, though, this gives you quite a knobbly finish, which isn't really ideal. Um, we've also looked at inkjet printing, which works in a similar way to uh, the sorts of printers that you might have at home. Um, this gives much smoother features, but uh, they, they're not very good at making sharp edges. And there's also digital light processing, where we can take a vat of a material and use light to selectively harden it. And so by doing that, we can actually produce really quite nice, sharp features. And you can see here down at the bottom, a sample terahertz lens that we've produced using this kind of approach. OK, so now. Um, the other approach is to try and make smarter optics. So I've shown how we can make these custom uh, optical devices. But what if we want the optics to be controllable? And so as an example of this, when we use our quantum cascade laser, the power that comes out of it is actually quite unstable. It'll, um, it'll go up and down. And that means that the sensing will have some uh, that, that we try to do with this will be quite noisy. Um, it's also the, the beam that comes out of these devices isn't very well controlled. So what we've been doing is developing liquid crystal based devices. And these are the same kind of technology that you might have in your TV screens. 
um, where by applying an electrical voltage, we can make the material more transparent or more opaque to terahertz light. And by doing that, we can actually control the power of the terahertz waves that are coming through the structure. And you can see here on the right that uh, we have a terahertz wave coming along. As we turn on our liquid crystal device, we can reduce the terahertz power to a defined level. And we can use this technique to stabilize it and also to control the shape of the beam. So just to summarize, we've um, talked about the unique sensing capabilities of terahertz radiation and how we can use this to look at things in space and in the Earth's upper atmosphere. We've looked at how we can integrate terahertz sources to these tiny sugar cube sized devices. And we've, um, we've talked about adaptive and custom optics that we can produce using 3D printing and liquid crystal technology. Um, so finally, if you're um, a student who's thinking of going on to further study and you're interested in what I've been talking about, um, I'd love to hear from you. We have postgraduate study opportunities uh, available quite often. And I'll finish just by thanking all of the uh, people who funded this work, including the UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship, and uh, the UK Space Agency and uh, the EPSLC Hyper Terahertz Consortium. And of course, all of my colleagues at the University of Leeds and uh, RAL Space who've contributed to this work. Wow, that's fantastic, Alex. Amazing. So we've got some really interesting questions coming through. Um, there's clearly a lot of interest in what you in what talk about. Space is obviously a, 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 a buzzword for everybody. So. Uh, a couple of questions that you might need to actually uh, expand upon a little bit, uh, Alex. Uh, one here from AC. Uh, can the ALMA radio telescope receive the terahertz signals from these astronomical gases? Yeah, so ALMA, um, if people don't know, um, ALMA is a very large um, array of telescopes um, up in the Atacama Desert in uh, Chile. And um, if you look at it, it's basically a whole load of these huge satellite dishes on movable platforms. It's very high up, so it's above a lot of the Earth's atmosphere. Now, it does actually have receivers that are working up to the sort of hundreds of gigahertz. But when you try to get up to the terahertz, um, it's very difficult because the Earth's atmosphere has a lot of water in it. And even at that high altitude, the water in the atmosphere will absorb a lot of the uh, the terahertz waves coming in from space. So really, if you wanted to do this properly, you really need to be on a, a much higher platform. So um, either on a, an aircraft, but that's incredibly expensive to run as a regular thing, um, and you can only do very short observations, or um, on a, a small satellite platform, which would be in low, low Earth orbit. Could you do this sort of thing with the um... James Webb Space Telescope, for example, that's going to be launched. Is that, does that work um, in the same wavelengths? In principle, you could uh, set up various instruments using something like James Webb, but the optics, I think, would be the real problem there. Um, one potential option would be to put something on the International Space Station. Uh, that way, I mean, they have a, a fairly regular program to install um, instruments. Yeah, that's amazing. OK, um, I think I, I, we've got another question from AC, um, which I'll just quickly jump to and then we'll, we'll go back to one that uh, Sergey uh, put forward. Um, if your QC laser is your local oscillator, then what is used for the mixer in the radiometer? Yeah, so again, um, just to clarify for other people in the audience, um, in a receiver, you need two things. Um, so if you think about your radio set in the car, you've got one thing which is the local oscillator and so that's the thing that you uh, um, use to target a particular radio station so if you want radio one you have a thing at 98.9 megahertz very pure tone that's exactly the frequency you want and in our terahertz system that's a, low, uh, a quantum cascade laser you then have a mixer which you use to mix together your your own pure uh, tone with the thing coming in through the antenna. And that converts the thing from the antenna down into a range that you can hear. So that's called a mixer. Um, now, in the terahertz system, I've talked about the local oscillator bit, but the mixer is also very difficult. Um, 
that would be based on something called shock diode technology, um, which is, again, a semiconductor device where you have a piece of uh, silicon or gallium arsenide and um, a, a very small wire bonded onto it, which allows it to um, operate very rapidly. Um, there are other techniques like hot electron bolometers, but they need, um, they need to be cooled to extremely low temperatures to work. So you mentioned some uh, fancy sounding uh, materials there, gallium arsenide for being one. So in, in your uh, QCL, in your quantum cascade laser, what, what specific types of materials is it that you're actually layering up in your atomic layers? Yeah, so again, they're, they're custom made uh, materials. So we make a crystal by uh, growing it layer by layer. And so the materials that we would use are gallium arsenide and aluminium gallium arsenide. So they're basically two... Um, semiconductors, which you make very, very thin uh, layers of by evaporating them very precisely under an extremely high vacuum. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to jump to uh, the last question, which is from Sergey. Uh, how do you define the temperature at the height of 150 kilometers? It seems that the gas is very rare at this height. So is there th the thermal equilibrium there? Yeah, so it, it's a bit counterintuitive. You'd think that as you go higher and higher up, it gets colder and colder. But actually, what's happening is the um, the gas molecules, because they're being um, bombarded by ultraviolet, um, you can take your sort of cold molecule, smash ultraviolet light into it, which breaks it apart, and you have very fast moving, um, very high energy uh um radicals so sort of fragments of molecules sitting up there so the temperature that you're talking about up there is really the sort of kinetic energy of those uh, uh radical species fantastic well thank you very much alex that's uh, really insightful and uh, as uh, always space is really fascinating um and a guinness world record is that yourself or is oh, that... i don't know if it's going in the guinness book but uh yeah it was actually well i was on the paper but i can't claim to um have made the device i characterized it um so it was produced by um our, our colleagues at leeds uh primarily uh lee Lianka and um, edwin linfield and um then there was uh hanning jung and uh muhammad sally who uh who produced the device itself Oh, it's definitely a world record worth holding. Better than beans in a bathtub, I guess, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Possibly. Well, Although yeah, I, I think more people will be interested in the beans in the bathtub. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Alex. That was fascinating. I think it's... Uh... Oh, hang on. We just have one last moment question uh, from AC. Um, if we can just yeah. drop it on quickly. What was the power output of the QC laser? Uh, the it's just short. Record? Yeah, it's just short of two and a half watts which is really quite huge when you're talking about terahertz waves. Because if you think of the number of photons that you have to be producing, and the photons only carry a, a few milli electron volts, um, it, it, you know, it, it's really vast number of photons that are coming out of this device. And what amount of energy, like ele electrical energy, do you have to pump into that to get? That oh, loads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, we're driving it, I think, with about a 20 amp um, current source. So, yeah, but it's only, it's producing the light in very short pulses. So the time averaged power is quite low. Mm. Okay, amazing. Well, sorry, th thank you again, Alex. And I think it's time to move on to our final speaker. So last but not least, uh, it's time to hear from Nikita. And she'll be telling us all about how we can shape or control terahertz radiation. Nikita, over to you. Hello. So like Lucy, I'm also an imposter. I'm not at the University of Leeds. I'm from the University of Cambridge. Um, so one of the other um, collaborators on the Hyperterahertz Consortium. So I'm going to talk about how we can shape graphene, uh, sorry, shape terahertz light. Um, and we can you do that using graphene and artificial atoms. So I guess first, what is an artificial atom? Well, an artificial atom is Unlike a natural material whose optical properties depend on the chemistry or the constituent atoms, a metamaterial or an artificial atom derives its optical properties from the geometry of its nanoscale unit cells. So this means that we can design a material to have a certain effect on the light that hits it. So 
what does this look like? Well, you'll probably be quite surprised that you've actually seen um, very similar materials in nature. Um, so one example of this is in morpho butterflies. So they aren't actually blue like you would think they are. The iridescent blue color actually comes from the nanoscale structure um, and the nanoscale shape inside their wings, which you can see in the bottom left corner. And it is the interaction of the light with the different um, shapes and sizes of this structure in here that, give, that makes it look like it is blue. So well, why is this useful? Well, as we've already heard from both Lucy and Alex, um, there aren't many naturally occurring materials that terahertz interacts with well. So using metamaterials where we can design the properties um, of a material or a device is one way that we can use to sort of control the light. Um, these are these kind of materials and these devices are needed for lots of different applications in sort of the space applications, the security applications and spectroscopy um, and communication applications as well that we've already heard a bit about. Okay, so now I'll show you some artificial metamaterials. So one of the first metamaterials that was made was made by printing small metal structures onto stacks of plastic. And you can sort of see the first examples of these that were made. And these were made to work with microwave, um, microwave light. Um, as they passed through, um, the light was uh, shaped and changed. So we can apply this to terahertz as well. But how do they work? Well. Light can be described as a wave that contains an oscillating electric field. And this oscillating electric field affects the charged particles, such as the electrons. And this leads to a small shift in the distribution of the charge in the surface of the metal. So we can apply this to more complex designs and more complex metallic structures that we can print onto the surface um, of a device or a material. Um, these structures can be made up of metal bars and horseshoe type shapes. And when the light interacts with it, when the terahertz hits these structures, it causes the electron charge and the distribution to change across the surface of the metal. And you can see this in the different sort of blue and red on this picture on the right. So where you have the blue, you've got more electrons and like on the red it's where you have a lack of electrons and you have less concentration there. Well, then we want to sort of control them and make these dynamic. Um, and we can do this using graphene. So it's uh, a really a good way of controlling the material because you can just use an electric potential. It can work at room temperature as well as low temperature. Um, and it can be designed to be quite quick as well and can be quite easy to fabricate. And so we can just put small patches of graphene um, in the areas where we have sort of the most charge. And this allows us to change the properties of the metamaterial we have. So the design I showed you before is actually used for polarization rotation. So as the terahertz beam hits the device where we have sort of an array of these different structures, we can rotate the light um, and we can rotate it by different amounts depending on the voltage that we apply across the device. And so specific um, uses and applications for these type of devices can be in spectroscopy. So identifying different chemicals sort of from the fingerprint that we've heard earlier. Um, and this is really important for the polarization um, because you can get different types of material, different chemicals um, that can have respond very differently to different polarizations of light. Um, and we can also use this in communications applications, sort of encoding or encrypting different signals. Um, which is another sort of exciting possibility that terahertz can be used for in the future. So, is there any questions? Well, thank you. That was great. So, I'm really fascinated by the uh, the butterfly wing. Are there any other uh, examples of um, structured structured materials that create iridescent light or or, or change the colour of light based on the structure? in nature that you're aware of? So I'm not aware of too many. I think there are certain types of beetle that also use um, a similar kind of thing um, to get that sort of iridescent color across the shell. Um, I'm not aware of any others, but I think there probably are a few. And are there any, uh, does it only essentially radiate or change the, the color of light? Is it capturing certain wavelengths of light? Is that how it works? Um, so normally they work by simply as the light passes through them or is reflected off them, 
they will cause a small change um, to the properties of the light. So this can be either the polarization, so rotating them, or it can be sort of the phase. So as you can see, the light is a wave, so it'll, the wave will be slightly different when it comes back. Or it can be the amplitude as well. So I think um, we kind of saw it that similarly in um, Alex's presentation, where um, they were going to use certain materials to um, stabilize the laser. And you can do that as well with metamaterials as well. Um, they can change the amplitude of the transmitted radiation. Fantastic. So I noted that on on your uh, slide, we're talking about placing graphene onto your uh, metastructures. How, how large are these structures and, and how do you go about doing that? How do you place graphene in a specific location on your structure? So these individual structures are really quite small. There are only a few tens of microns across. So that's kind of about the width of a hair. Um, so we need quite a lot of them um, over like in a big array or in a mosaic to try and actually have an effect over um, quite a large beam. Um, the graphene itself is about one to two micron square patches. So they're really quite small. So we can't obviously can't do that by hand. So we have to use something called uh, lithographic techniques, which is just a bit like printing really. So you put a large amount of graphene on the surface and then you spin a resist, it's just a bit like an ink, and then you can expose a pattern on it. And you can do this using photolithography where you use a UV light and effectively a stencil over the top or you can use something called electron beam lithography, where um, a computer controls an electron beam and draws a pattern across the surface. And then just like with photo photography, you um, put it in a developer, and this gives you little bits of windows across your sample. So then you can then remove graphene from certain areas, and that's how you get these very small patterns across the surface. Amazing. So the same, same technology that you use to create uh, computer chips in your phone, for example, that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly the same technology. So we have a, a question from AC here. Um, can circular polarization be produced by metamaterials at these wavelengths? Yes, it can. Um, so, yeah, the QCLs typically have a linear polarization um, produced due to the, the vertical stacking of the different materials. Um, but yes, circular polarization can be useful in lots of other applications, and you can use metamaterials to produce this. Um, there, I think there are some papers that exist um, from our group as well, sort of showing and sort of an elliptical polarization. There is still some work needed to get it to be a proper linear to circular conversion. But yes, you can do that. Um, but you need to employ slightly different techniques. So you need uh, different layers of devices as well. Um, different layers of these different arrays is sort of the way to go with that. Wonderful. OK, well, with that, I think uh, it, it's time. But there is a question here from uh, from Stephen. but. Um, it's actually a, quite a broad question. I'd, I'd like to invite all three, uh, well, all the other two speakers back, sorry, to, to join so that we can ask uh, the, the panel, I think, really, this, this final question. Welcome back, Alex. And oh, we're, we're missing one. I we're think missing. Lucy had to leave it. Oh, that's unfortunate. Well, welcome back, Alex. Anyway, it's nice, nice to have you back. So uh, the final question here from Stephen, which uh, really uh, speaks to broadly across all the, the talks that we've had this evening. Um, uh, what terahertz possibilities or applications are you most excited about? Um, OK, I mean, I, I'm happy to go. Uh, essentially, I think this is a very broad question, but I think there are really two main things from my perspective in uh, my research area, which are firstly, what I've called real chemistry, in that people have only really done quite sort of limited studies using terahertz waves, where they're just doing quite simple sort of send some light through a thing and see what happens. Um, but trying to make that into something that real chemists actually use, where you integrate these really quite nice terahertz sources that we've got these days into things that give you very high sensitivity. They give you um, the ability to detect tiny quantities of gases and so on. That would give us a huge amount of um, extra potential information about the processes that drive climate change. And also things like understanding um, uh, biomedical uh, trace gas sensing and so on. It just unlocks a huge amount uh, that we could do. The other side of it is what I've called real world, 
where that means making instruments that don't have to sit in a very specialized lab anymore made of lots of components really taking what we're developing and integrating it down into tiny platforms that you can bring out into clinical environments or take out onto field studies and put on satellites i think those are the two sides of terahertz technology that i think would unlock everything do you ever see it um i, I think it's been mentioned before about this obviously spectroscopy you can see through layers of paint and these sorts of things do you ever envision that it it might reach a stage of miniaturization where you can have a handheld device in an airport and test uh, packages for, for drugs or that sort of thing you think yeah potentially i mean i, I think the trouble that you're always going to fight against with terahertz is that it's absorbed by water in the atmosphere and so having uh some level of control around it i think will always be necessary um, you know, it, just having a sort of terahertz sensor that you can point at somebody across the room, I think, is quite uh, uh, some way off. But actually having a handheld gadget or a conveyor belt system that can scan packages going underneath, that kind of thing could work quite well. Or uh, lab instruments that could be produced um, commercially, that's certainly within the next, you know, five, ten years of, of development. Mm -hmm. And in terms of obviously the, the quantum cascade lasers, then the, the, these miniaturized sources, they're produced in only a handful of places have the capability to create these atomic. Mm -hmm. So, in, in terms of commercializing this and or, or kind of you know putting it out in the, in the, the wild, mm -hmm. how expensive is it to produce these sorts of things? Then? Yeah, well, it it's one of those things that you. Terahertz systems at this stage are not going to be the kind of thing that everybody has built into their smartphone, right? That that level of scale is not what we're aiming for. What we are aiming for is to make individual specialized systems that would be suitable for working in a particular environment. So, um, I mean, the manufacturing side of it is a whole area of research in itself. And scalability of processes is incredibly complicated. But I mean, making devices that individually are good enough to go into a, um, a satellite or into a, um, a, 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 um, a hospital or something like that, that's kind of, I think, a very manageable task. Um, and the scalability isn't really a problem at that stage. So the cost of producing the devices is kind of as a as a one-off i mean if you look at the sorts of amounts of money that people pay for an mri scanner as a hospital it's huge you've got a lot of budget to play with for that kind of thing um and i don't think we're anywhere near that you know you'd be talking the maybe the tens of thousands opposed to the sort of hundreds of thousands that you might right. pay okay. for a, specialized. a sense of, yeah. a sense of yeah. a budgetary scale is, is yeah yeah so i mean if i if I say it's going to be ten thousand pounds for for one of our systems, you've got to put it in context to understand what that means. Yeah, great. And Nikita, I I guess we balance the same question back to you. In, obviously, you're in your you're, you're doing a PhD at the moment. Am I correct? So, um, is there anywhere in particular that excites you about the the future of terahertz and in, in, in your work? And is there any particular application that you'd like to see developed from from what you're doing? Yeah, so I think, um, as Alex said, I'm really interested in sort of seeing it become more into sort of the real world applications. Um, so seeing terahertz actually used in communication systems. So it'd probably only be in short range communications for high security um, kind of applications or maybe in sort of a home network. But I'd be really interested in seeing it integrated into those kind of settings. It would be quite different, with, difficult with a, a QCL. Um, as Alex has said, because they are very high cost and that would be more in maybe the research or an industrial kind of setting. But I think we are sort of now starting to get that there's been enough research done um, that it should be in the near future when we start to see it being used and maybe more in people's everyday lives. Amazing. Okay, well, I'm afraid we've run out of time now. There are a couple of questions uh, still in the chat, but unfortunately uh, we have to draw this session to a close. We can, of course, uh, ask the speakers uh, questions offline um, uh, and continue to comment in on the video once it's uh, once the, the live stream is finished. Um, so 
Thank you very much to our speakers. Uh, we had a great time learning about the wonders of terahertz this evening. Thank you for joining us from home and sending uh, in all of your questions. Uh, we hope you enjoyed tonight's event. Uh, and if you did, why not let us know by tweeting us at, at UniLeadsEngage and using the hashtag BeCurious21. We'd really like, uh, like to welcome your feedback on tonight's event. So please let us know what you uh, thought about uh, this event by filling in the short evaluation available at the link, which is at the top of your screen now. Our moderators will be able to share the link in the chat with you. Those of you who booked the session will also receive an email with the link to evaluate from tomorrow. And your feedback is really important to us so we can improve these events um, uh, in the future. Don't forget to have a look at the rest of the Be Curious program available at www.leads.ac.uk forward slash Be Curious. All the events are free to attend and we'd love to see you there. Uh, that's it from us for now. Uh, have a great evening and thanks for joining us. And from myself and all of our wonderful speakers this evening, I'd like to say goodbye and good night. <laughs>